Good morning and happy May 17th. Welcome to Aberdeen Baptist Church. And my name is Greg Duke. I'm the pastor here. And we are grateful that you found us on YouTube this morning. We find ourselves in the midst of spring outside, but still on the stay-at-home or safer-at-home order right now in the state of Colorado. So we are. And now we'll share a little bit later on perhaps some changes coming to that in the next couple of months, but we will, uh, we'll talk about that later. We are glad that you're with us, though, and if you are just watching for the first time, there will be a survey in the show notes on YouTube below. If you would uh, send a, us a, a message through that, we'd just like to know that you watched and maybe how you found us here on YouTube, whether you found us on Facebook or through Instagram or whatever other platform you found us on. We, we're we just glad that you're here, glad you're watching, that we can worship the Lord together and celebrate Him today. Um, don't forget that you can give to the work of Christ through Aberdeen Baptist Church online. That is found at aberdeenpueblo.org slash giving or on the Easy Tithe app through the app store on your phone. You can also mail us a check to the church or you can drop it by as many of you guys have. I am so thankful that our church has stayed strong financially through this season. It's hard to know when we have such a drastic change in how we are doing things how things will look, but I am thankful for you, and I'm thankful for your faithfulness to giving to the work of Christ. Uh, find a way to serve one another this week. Find a way to, uh, to, to connect with your neighbors, your fellow church members, and uh, to serve one another uh, in that way. I am thankful for all of our Bible study leaders as that thought passes through my mind, for those who have been dedicated through this season in teaching through our Zoom classes, and if you want to be a part of those, uh, you can send some info, information to the church as well and ask about how to get involved with those as well. We can send you the link, and uh, we got we got some good classes that are doing some uh, wonderful study along the way as well. Uh, again, we are grateful for you, and we're going to pray and get started in worship as uh, Allison and Zach lead us, and Caitlin will be doing our Bible story again this week. Uh, we have uh, the chance to worship the Lord together. So let's pray. Our God, you are faithful to us. Thank you for the chance you give us to serve you. I pray, Lord, as we worship you today, that we would fully set our hearts, our souls, and our minds on your goodness and upon your grace. And no matter where we are and how we're watching this right now, help us to keep our hearts focused on you. May you be glorified today as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in His temple. For he will conceal me when troubles come. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. Then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. At his sanctuary, I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy, singing and praising the Lord with music. Hear me as I pray, O Lord. Be merciful and answer me. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I'm coming. Do not turn your back on me. Do not reject your servant in anger. You have always been my helper. Don't leave me now. Don't abandon me, O God of my salvation. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. Teach me how to live, O Lord. Lead me along the right path, for my enemies are waiting for me. Do not let me fall into their hands, for they accuse me of things I have never done. With every breath they have threatened with violence. Yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on our social distancing worship experience. That's what we call it now, consistently, for the last 16, 17, 14 weeks, 8 years, I don't know. Branding. Time is irrelevant at this point. 
So you don't know what day we're here. I don't know what day you're here. We're just here to praise the Lord, and we're going to do that right now. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King of Shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. That you would bear. our chaos back into order, who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing praise. This is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. This is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing for
oppressed but not crushed, persecuted not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure, that his joy is going to be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes in the morning. talking to a crowd of people, some crowded as, to as close as, to Jesus as they could. They didn't want to miss a single word he was saying, but some people gathered in little groups to keep their distance from Jesus. They whispered among themselves, does Jesus think that we Pharisees will associate with the, those sinners standing close to Jesus? The, those people aren't worthy of our company. The Pharisees thought they were too good to be with the others. Jesus knew what these men were thinking. He decided to teach them a lesson. Jesus often taught people a truth by telling a parable. The story Jesus told was about two men, a Pharisee and a publican. One day, Jesus began, two men went into the temple to pray. The people who lived near Jerusalem often went to the temple to pray. It was the place to worship God. One man in the story was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were very strict in making up rules, over 600 of them, but many of the rules didn't make any sense. However, the only thing the Pharisees were worried about was keeping these rules. In keeping these rules, they felt very proud and very religious, and they thought themselves to be much better than other people who didn't keep the rules that they had made. Then Jesus continued his story. The other man in the story was a publican or a tax collector. He turned his back on God when he joined the Roman government. He became rich by charging the people more taxes than he should have and by keeping part of the money for himself. These two men, the Pharisee and the publican, went into the temple to talk to God. The Pharisee was proud that God was listening to him pray. But how could God hear his prayer? All the Pharisee was doing was praying very loudly so other people would hear him. Dear God, he shouted, I'm glad I'm not greedy and selfish like that tax collector standing over there in the corner. He's a cheater. Then he began to tell God the good things he did. I keep all the rules. I give you a tenth of my money each week. I don't even eat food on certain days. I don't do anything bad. His prayers never got higher than the ceiling of the temple. The publican knew he wasn't a very good person. He bowed his head and beat his hands on his chest and spoke in such a quiet voice only God could hear him. Oh God, he prayed, I don't have any right to your mercy, but please forgive me for my sins. Then Jesus turned to the people. Do you know who do you know whose prayer God answered? Yes, the publicans. He went home a happy man because God had forgiven him. The Pharisee went home unforgiven. He thought he was better than the others, but God wasn't impressed when he told God all the good things he did. 
You see, the Pharisee wasn't talking to God at all. He was just talking to himself, telling himself how great and important he was. He was religious, but his heart was not right to God, and God did not hear his prayers. Self-righteousness is dangerous. It leads to pride, causes a person to hate others, and prevents one from listening and to learning to and learning from God. As 
question for you as we get uh, rolling with the message this morning. How are you doing? How are you feeling? And what kind of experiences are you going through here? Do you feel like you've been persecuted or, or forced to do things you don't want to do or maybe that you're suffering unjustly? You know, those questions are real and those things are, are, are good to consider as we uh, think about our lives today. And yeah, we, we are experiencing some different things as Christians, as Americans, as citizens of earth, really. The real need we, we must address in our lives, though, is whether or not Christ is being glorified where we are and in what we're doing. Last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talked about how these super apostles, these people that he kind of mocked along the way, uh, these people who were showing themselves to be you know, super important and, and, and more wise than Paul, he, he shows uh, that he has his own manner of foolishness, and that is to follow Christ. Well, he continues on with this because it, this theme carries through to the end of the book, actually. Paul is addressing critics, he's, he's facing challenges along the way, and he really wants to know, wants, I'm sorry, wants the church in Corinth to know that he's coming to them with the true authority of the, uh, the Holy Spirit, and the teaching he has is to show the authority of Christ in the world. And as we look at the last chapter here, it's really one of the more autobiographical sections that we have about the Apostle Paul. We see a lot of the things that he endured on a mission for Christ, the ways he experienced suffering, the things that just happened to him as circumstantial, but also the ways he was persecuted and the ways he, he was punished for his trusting and his obedience in Christ. And I would contend that in history, there have been those who have suffered for their faith to the point of death. And we know that Paul, through church tradition, lost his life for his faith in Christ. But I would wonder if there's anyone beyond the Lord himself that has experienced greater hardship than Paul did because of his faithfulness for Christ, faithfulness to Christ. I think about the stories that we read in the book of Acts, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what he experienced and, and the, the stories and the ways he suffered in the last half of the book of Acts, but, but we, we're going to really dwell with the things he goes through here at the end of chapter 11. Paul went through the most awful experiences because of his obedience to Christ, and as we we face a different reality from what we have experienced in our lives to this point, where we don't feel like we necessarily have the freedoms we once did in our nation to worship the Lord together. I want us to be reminded that there are people facing far greater suffering than we are right now. And we still have the opportunities, the chances to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in this time. And as we look at what the Apostle Paul endured, May we be encouraged to stay faithful to the Lord together. So I'm going to start in reading the first section here 
And then we will continue through as Paul shares some of the experiences that he endured because of his obedience to Christ. And next week we'll continue into chapter 12 where Paul shares even more about some of the things he endured along the way. Like I said, this really is a personal account for the things that Paul endured because of his obedience to Christ. And I hope that we are encouraged because of our circumstances now that we can still proclaim the good news of Jesus. So 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll read verses 16 through 21 to start out. And, and then uh, by the end of the message, we will, we will conclude chapter 11. I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool, so that I too may boast a little. What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. So he begins, and he talks about ways he is going to boast now. And he, he shows that his, his boasting now in earthly circumstances, and even in accordance to what God would have him to do, would be foolishness. Because what he's going to tell us about is all the stuff that he has endured for Christ. And, you know, I think about martyrs as parents and, and ways we, uh, we want to compare that our kids might be harder than some other kids. But I know that, you know, as my kids will be watching right now, I got great kids and, and parenting is hard. And we want to make, make these different uh, uh, challenges seem like they're better or worse than somebody else's. But that's not the kind of suffering or martyring that we're talking about here. What we really see when we talk about martyrdom is the true uh, essence of the definition of that word. The word martyr means a, a witness to a circumstance or a witness for a person. And those who martyred for Christ, we, we now associate, rightfully so, with those who would suffer for their faith, those who might even lose their lives because they believe in Jesus Christ and they won't back down in their faithfulness for Him. And martyrdom has been a reality throughout the history of the church. People have suffered for their faith from the start. Let's look at our Lord Himself and what He went through in His suffering, His crucifixion, His death, and His resurrection. And those apostles that followed Him, they, they, uh, they, they continued in their mission. And the majority of them lost their faith, or lost their lives for their faith. Now Paul is talking about the things he has endured. And he calls it, his boasting here, to be foolishness. Because in comparison to what Christ has gone through, it, it pales. Christ took on flesh. God himself took on flesh. Think about what that would be at first. You are God personified. You, you live out a perfect existence. And now, in Philippians 2, we see the suffering that Christ endured for us just by putting on humanity. But ultimately, he takes the penalty of death. He could have cast off that at any point in time, but he knew that the way we would be redeemed would be by the perfect spotless sacrifice. And so now, Paul calls his own suffering foolishness compared to that. But he calls boasting in general to be foolishness. Because really what it amounts to is not anything that we can do ourselves or what we have endured, but what Christ has done for us. And now his life and his witness is built on that. He says, many boast according to the flesh. He, he too will boast. So, I, for you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. You bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the faith. 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 Face. He might strike you in the faith, too. That's a different issue. i got to get my tongue straightened out this, this morning. But he says, to my shame... We were too weak for that. We, in our suffering, will never reach the point that Christ endured for us. 
Christ gave himself according to the law, earthly law and God's law, so that we would have salvation. So in, in any circumstances that we face here on earth, we must return to the fact that Christ gave himself willingly so that we might find salvation. And that's one of the greatest challenges we're going to face in any, challenge, in any, any, uh, any time in our lives. Whether it's right now, where, we're, where we feel like maybe our constitutional rights aren't being uh, properly observed, or whether it's, uh, it's a suffering that we would have interpersonally, a relationship. Maybe somebody has wronged us, or maybe that you have made a mistake that has hurt someone else. Ultimately, it pales in comparison to what Christ has endured for us, because He suffered unjustly. He suffered for our benefits. And the boasting that we can, we can make now can only come because of what He has completed for us. Nevertheless, Paul continues, and he talks about the things that he's endured. We see in the book of Acts in chapter 22, we also see towards the end of the book of Acts in chapters 27 and 28, the different kinds of things that Paul has, has gone through. We see that his life was one of passion. If you know anything about the Apostle Paul, he began his life as an arduous uh, Jew. He worked his, uh, his life to death. He worked so hard to try to live in approval to God. And he thought that Christians were fools. And to the point that he held the coats when Stephen, the first person who lost his life for his faith in Christ, he held the coats for those to throw rocks at Stephen, to stone him till his, till his death. Then in, in Acts chapter 9, he was on his way to Damascus to, to persecute the church with letters. And Paul, uh, sorry, as Saul, he appears, to, uh, Christ appears to Saul and says, why are you persecuting me? Paul comes to faith at that moment. And later, he takes the name Paul so that he has better uh, relationships with the Gentiles who he is called to be a missionary to. He places his faith and his trust in Jesus Christ, and instead of the persecutor, he becomes the persecuted. He faces trials and suffering. So let's, let's look at what Paul endures here. And he, uh, he shows himself then in this foolishness as, as one who has endured far more than any of these super apostles that he addresses in the first part of the chapter. Verse, the end of verse 21, it says, But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the offspring of Abraham? So am I. So he has brought them to, uh, he's, he's brought himself to a point of equality with these super apostles. Now, he says, are they servants of Christ? This is where he pulls out the ridiculous. He calls himself a better one. I am talking like the madman or a madman. He says, I'm, I'm crazy to speak like this. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Now, he could just stop there. But now he goes into more specific ways that he has suffered for his faith. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. It was believed that, and it came to the law, that 40 lashes would be the ultimate punishment. In Deuteronomy, it speaks of that. And that the 40th lash should be the point of death. So 39 lashes he receives five different times. Three times he was beaten with rods. That was a Roman punishment. Once, he was stoned. We read about that in his testimony uh, in the time when he visited the city of Lystra. He was left for dead, and they thought he was dead. That's why they left him alone. But no, Paul, uh, God had more, more plans for Paul. He survived it. Can you imagine what he looked like after all of these things? All of the scars that his body bore and perhaps the disfigurement of his face. Can you imagine being pelted with rocks to the point of death and what that would do to the human body? Paul endured all these things and then he survived. 
This was the human circumstance that he dealt with. Now we get to the point of the circumstances of the world. The problems with the weather, we'll see. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, dangers in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and in hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. So Paul faced suffering due to the, the earthly uh, reality, the weather the, the shipwrecks, the floating at sea for a day and a night. Now, looking at all of those different things, I can tell you, I can, I can tell you on no hands how many times I've experienced any of that. I haven't. And chances are, if you have, it's been on a minor, uh, it been, been, a, uh, been a lesser experience than what Paul did here. In the days of Paul, uh, the, the water was a major fast source of transportation for them, but the Mediterranean Sea was unstable. And so he experienced a shipwreck three times. Well, I can actually tell you how often I've been on a boat in the last 20 years is close to that. You know, we, we talk about the suffering that we face. You know, I've been to Europe a couple of times, and, and I can tell you it's a little stressful to get on a on a an aluminum tube and shoot across the ocean at hundreds of miles per hour. But I can also think that as the moments I've been on those planes, I'm not on a boat for three months, and I'm not experiencing the hardship. And the, and the, the stats showed that it was pretty, a pretty safe way to travel. And I got there, and I got back safely. The hardships that we think we endure in life pale in comparison even to what they pale today. Just this week, we've been dealing with turning on the coolers and the facilities, and, you know, we, we get hot in our houses, so we turn on our air conditioners. You know, we make our comfort our God. We, we want everything to be just the way it's supposed to be in our minds. And often we worship that experience and don't think about the hardships along the way. Paul is showing that for his faith, he endured ridiculous circumstances. He was left for dead because he believed in Jesus Christ. So I ask you again the question I asked at the start. How are you doing today? Now, I don't want us to pull some kind of guilt trip here, but I want us to come to a point of reality that the suffering we think that we're enduring pales in comparison to what those who have really been challenged for their faith go through. We still have the freedom to proclaim Christ in our lives. And if we aren't taking those opportunities that we're just complaining about the chances that we don't get to come to a church facility and, and worship together, then we, we aren't really fulfilling the Great Commission in our lives. There are chances around us all over the place to proclaim, the Christ, and proclaim Christ freely. And let's take advantage of those chances. And in many ways, we've had better chances over the last couple of months than we had before. You know, some of you may be watching today, and you might not even have paid attention to a church service before two months ago, but because somebody offered a link to a video service that you might know me or you might know somebody else in our church family, you're watching and you're learning about the truth of Christ. The fact is, the Christian experience is one of suffering. Paul tells us in other places that we should take up our cross, that to live is Christ and to die is gain. Jesus says to take up your cross daily and to follow him. The experience of the Christian life is one of suffering. So Paul talks about what he's going through and the en enduring things. He went through the hardship, the sleepless nights, and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And it says, and apart from other things, there's what he would normally endure as a minister of the gospel. There's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. So there's a concern that we would be learning the Word of God. On top of all of the hardship and the suffering, he never neglects his calling. 
He goes back to what he is meant to do and how he has been, uh, been called to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, that Christ endured as the perfect sacrifice, fulfilling the law and the prophets, paying the price on the cross, and rising from the dead from when he, uh, on that third day. So he continues in his boasting. He says, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, He who is blessed forever, ever, knows that I am not lying. The most important thing that we must, uh, we must call ourselves into account for is what God thinks of us. See, it's not what you and I think of each other ultimately. It's whether or not we are accountable to the Lord. And I've heard that as an excuse for people's behavior, for people's sinful behavior. Say, you know, God alone is my judge. You can't be. Yes, God does actually call us to account in, to one another, but so that we may grow in godliness, so that we may live a life worthy of what Christ has done for us. Ultimately, Christ is our judge. Christ as our judge took our penalty, and now we are called to live in a way that blesses Him. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, He who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. And then he comes back to a little bit of this autobiographical part. He says, At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. All these different hardships and sufferings, he, he endured for the sake of proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Damascus was the city decades before that he had been visiting in order to persecute the church. He had taken letters from Jerusalem in order to persecute the church in, in Syria, in Damascus. And now he has returned, or he, he tells of returning to Damascus in order to proclaim the gospel. And he did it to such an extent that he was forced to escape the city out of the city wall window. None of us have endured suffering to that extent. We still have the privilege and the calling to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to live it out today. So in the testimony of the Word of God, let us be reminded and encouraged that there have been so many before us that have endured far greater hardship than we could ever imagine. And be blessed because God has given us this avenue, this venue to proclaim the good news, to proclaim what Jesus has done for us. So whether you're lonely, whether you're discouraged, whether you are genuinely facing suffering for your faith, whether your family mocks you, whether your friends make fun of you, whether you believe that we are under persecution at this time, be reminded that the apostles, those that that followed Christ in His day and even throughout the history of the church for the last two millennia. There have been far more that have suffered far greater than we are right now. Stay in the Word. Trust Him. And pray for those who consistently proclaim the gospel, whether it's me as your pastor, whether it's your Sunday school teacher, your Bible study leader, whether it's the church next door, whether it's down the street, whether it's across the world. Let's take these chances and these opportunities and these moments of suffering to proclaim the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let's pray. God, you, you alone are worthy. And as Paul endured the suffering and the hardship that I could not even imagine in this day, I pray, God, that you draw us to faithfulness, radical faithfulness, the way you drew the Apostle Paul. And as we can be discouraged and, and face trials in this time, I pray, God, that you help us to trust you, to walk in your grace, to walk in your love, no matter where we are, no matter the trial we face. Encourage our hearts today by the presence of your spirits to be faithful to Christ, to follow him. In Jesus' name.
strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. glad you joined us today to worship the Lord. Remember, it's all about Jesus, and we, we focus on Him in this time and this season in our lives, that we, we, are, uh, we have a task, and that is to go and make disciples for Him. Our church has been ministering through this time to the Pueblo Rescue Mission. The Bicota class has been organizing some ways to give, and many of you have given, whether it's financially or you have given uh, food staples along the way or clothing. This week, we want to encourage you to give something like breakfast bars or snack bars to help those who receive services through the mission be uh, receiving uh, uh, proper nutrition through the day as well. So if you want to give to that end, that would be great. You can stop by the church and give uh, either financially or you can give some breakfast bars and snack bars. This past week, I sent out an email to our church family regarding reopening our facility for services. We don't yet have an official time frame for that, but we do need your feedback and uh, the things that you might be comfortable uh, be a part of. I have received a few messages, and we'd really like some more feedback and input from the church family as we look forward to meeting again together. It will be different for a while there will be masks involved, things like that. It, it's just going to be a little odd for a while, but uh, we hope to, uh, to, to have the chance to gather together and serve the Lord uh, and worship Him together as a church family. So, yeah, check your email. Please provide me some, impact, uh, some input as we work through these issues with our church leadership as well. So, be in prayer for your community. Be, uh, be looking for ways to serve the Lord together and uh, really just focus on that mission to make disciples for Jesus Christ. No matter where we are, no matter what, we, uh, what we're experiencing, that is the ultimate call in our lives. And uh, be, uh, be consistent, be in your, your Bibles daily, and be learning about Him and serving Him this week. Thanks for joining us this morning.